We're going to talk now about uh, helping children with this disrespectful attitudes, but before we do, I just want to give you a little bit of preliminary background information about communication. Um, do you ever have a, like, an obscure conversation with someone you thought was going to be an obscure conversation with someone and only to, only to walk away realizing that something profound was said? By the way, the material that we're going to be covering now, especially the disrespect part, is found in the <clears throat> teenager book, uh, Keeping Your Cool. Well, many years ago, <clears throat> the um, music director of our church was trying to persuade me that we needed a new public address system in the church. Why he was trying to talk to me about it, I, was, <laughs> I had absolutely nothing I could do about it, but he was giving me the spiel. And uh, <clears throat> in, the process, in the process of making his pitch, he said something that was profound. It was one of those things, as soon as he said it, I knew it was profound, I knew it was biblical, and sure enough, I, um, I went away and I started studying the scriptures just to see how accurate this guy was. And it, it, the more I studied the scriptures, the more I realized this guy is absolutely spot on. All he said to me was this. He said, if we Christians are in any business at all, we're in the communication business. I thought about that. I mean, take the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the God. Preach is a communication. Teaching them to observe teach is a communication word. You think about the, the means whereby Christians grow, right? Speaking the truth in love, we may grow up into him. And you think of all the, all the other imperatives or injunctions in the New Testament. I've counted so far almost 100 New Testament injunctions. They're all in the imperative, but they have the effect of an imperative. I mean, over or almost 100 different ways that we are commanded to communicate or not to communicate. That's just imperatives in the New Testament. That's not the rest of the New Testament. We're talking, we gives good and bad examples of communication. It's not the Old Testament, the injunctions, the principles, like in the book of Proverbs. I mean, there's tons of stuff in the Bible about communication. You know, death and life are in the power of the tongue, Solomon says, and those who love the power of the tongue will eat of the fruit of the power of the tongue. There's he who speaks like the piercing of the sword, but the tongue of the wise is held. All of these verses in the Bible about communication. I mean, stop and think what I do as a, as a counselor. I mean, people come in my office, something happens in my office, and as a result of the time I spend with them, their lives are changed, sometimes radically changed. Now, what is it that I do? Well, I listen and I talk. Of course, I'm not talking to them about my words, I'm talking to them about God's words, but the fact of the matter is, God communicates to us through language, and we communicate and minister to others largely through our language. And then, you know, think of, think of the whole process by which um, a husband and wife, for example, become one flesh. I and mean, when they get married, yes, in the law books of heaven, you know, they're one flesh, but it's sort of like sanctification. You get married and you're positionally one flesh, you become a Christian, you're positionally sanctified, but then you have to, like in progressive sanctification, you've got to work on becoming one flesh practically. And how does that happen? Well, the biggest single way it happens is when two people pull the curtain back and reveal who they are to each other. Revelation is a prerequisite for having a relationship. I don't know that you've ever stopped to think about it, but if it weren't for God's special revelation, we wouldn't know how to please God, we wouldn't know how to be saved. We'd know a few things through general revelation. We would know that, you know, certain, a few things about his eternal uh, power and Godhood and we know that we're in a lot of trouble with him. Well, we wouldn't know how to do anything about that. We wouldn't know how to be saved. We wouldn't know how to please him. It took special revelation. God had to pull the curtain back and disclose to us who he really is. And the same is true between two people, and especially a husband and wife, because the husband and wife relationship is the most intimate of all interpersonal relationships, right? To the extent that, that a husband and wife pull the curtain back and reveal who they are to each other, to that extent they can experience the one flesh intimacy. To the, expect, to the extent that they are not willing to do that, then their ability to really practically function as a one flesh couple, a one flesh unit, is going to be severely hindered. Now we're talking about parents, and we get to this point a little later, but for now suffice it to say that parenting is about having a relationship. Skip, Skip said that in the very beginning. If I could boil biblical parenting down to two principles, I would tell you this. Biblical parenting is about a relationship. You have a relationship with your kids. And secondly, you use the Bible as much as you can in your parenting. I mean, to me, those are like the two primary foundational principles of, of biblical parenting. But you have to have a relationship with your kids. You've got to, where it's appropriate, to pull the curtain back uh, in your own life, and you've got to encourage them to pull the curtain back 
in their life with you. All right, so uh, what do we have here? Oh, um, you know, in the Bible, there's this really interesting analogy between our heart and our mouth, and our heart and our lips. Um, it, it's sort of like this picture, or we could, also, we could also use this bottle. But the reservoir part of the bottle, or of the pitcher in this case, of the teapot, is analogous to our heart. And the spout, or, or the neck of the bottle, over which the liquid flows when we tilt it, and, and, and the spout of the uh, teapot, or the pitcher, is analogous to our mouth and our tongue and our lips. Right? And so look at this verse in Proverbs. The tongue of the wise makes knowledge acceptable, but the mouth of the fools spouts folly. And so in the Bible, whenever you see the word heart, and I mean almost literally 100% of the time, it's analogous or it's held over against something on the outward. It's the heart versus the mouth, the heart versus the lips, the heart versus the tongue, the heart versus the face, the heart versus the hands. It's the internal man versus the external man. Or how about this one? The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. So if there's water in this bottle, when I tilt it over, what's going to come out the neck of the bottle? And if there's iced tea in the bottle, what's going to come out? And if there's arsenic or gasoline, you know, in the bottle, what's going to come out when you tilt it over? It's like Jesus said, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth that which is evil, for of the abundance of the heart, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so, again, I could teach you and you can teach your kids all of this really cool, high-tech, biblical communication stuff and, and how to deal with a disrespectful attitude. Uh, or how to talk respectfully, I should say, but it's going to do them little good if they're not willing. It's going to do you little good if you're not willing to let the Lord deal with the stuff in your heart that's, you know, coming out of your mouth. And so that's really the point I wanted to make. So let's talk a little bit more about communication. Remember in the last session I talked about the communication pie. So as you are trying to teach your children how to communicate, and again, we, I know we're talking about disrespect, but remember, we're talking about redoing. We're talking about having children when they misbehave, when they flub a line, uh, when they are, in fact, disrespectful. We, we're teaching them how to gymnazo, okay? How to train themselves, exercise themselves to respond more respectfully. So remember, first of all, that disrespect is an attitude of the heart. I'm going to talk a little more about that in a minute. But that above and beyond that, yes, when disrespectful things come out of their mouth, you need to talk to them about what's in their heart, but then you have to help them to understand what is wrong with their words. And the Bible says the words are very, very important. The words are really most important. Remember I drew the communication pie right, in the last hour? Well, there are three elements of that. And it may be true that the tone of voice carries a lot more than we think it does, but biblically, um, the words is where the words are where we need to put the greatest emphasis because the words biblically carry the most weight. With your words, you'll be justified. With your words, you will be condemned. So the child misbehaves, and we're going to help him undo or, or unpack and repack it for him in a biblical. And you know, maybe you have to put the words in his mouth, or maybe not. Honey, do you realize how disrespectful you? Are? I'm sorry. All right, can you try that again without the sarcasm? Or can you try that again without, rolling, without, uh, um, without judging my motives? Would you like to ask me a question rather than falsely accusing me with, with that rash judgment that you just made about me? And you're going to get them to rehearse the right words. And then, of course, you're going to help them if they, once they get the words right. If the, if the tone of voice is not appropriate, you're going to have to help them to say the words the right way with the appropriate tone of voice. And again, the Bible talks about this. I alluded to this earlier. The Bible talks about a gentle answer versus harsh words. A gentle tongue, tongue, tongue breaks the bone. The Bible talks about a sharp reproof. Here it's actually a good thing. Certain people are to be reproved sharply. Um, the elders who sin, oh, actually that's a different passage, but there's another example. The elders who sin rebuke before all. Uh, it talks about fierce words in the Bible. It talks about sweetness of speech that increases persuasiveness. Uh, it talks over and over again <clears throat> about the importance of having grace. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the heroes. Let your communication be always with grace, seasoned with salt. 
The Bible talks about pleasant words like a honeycomb, and it talks about uh, the rich who answer roughly, for example, in the book of Proverbs. Now, these verses are not talking per se about tone of voice, but in our language, tone of voice is very much involved in some of these elements of what biblical speech is supposed to look like and sound like. And then, of course, there's the nonverbal forms of communication. As I said before, that's things like the facial expressions, your tone of voice, um, your posture. In families, we hug and we touch sometimes, as we're, even as we're communicating. And so, again, we have to consider all three parts of the pie when we are trying to train our children to be respectful. I have this message that I sometimes uh, share with uh, women when I speak to women's group, the, the message is entitled, How to Improve Your Looks from the Inside Out. And really all I've done is I've gone through the Bible and I've identified seven or eight specific sins that uh, when, when they're going on in our heart, they show up on our face. Remember the heart versus the face, right? The inside versus the outside. And I make the point to these ladies that... Um, it's really more uh, noticeable on women than it is on men, because, you know, guys are kind of rough and rugged anyway. But ladies have this subcutaneous layer of fat, this um, layer of fat underneath their skin that kind of softens things. And so when they're bitter or angry, uh, and I'm not talking about momentary, but like when there's stuff in your heart that's been going on for years, it's gonna affect your face and it's gonna show up on you a lot quicker typically than it does on us, or at least on you, it's gonna look a lot more uh, unusual or, or inappropriate than it does on us. So what are some of the sins that the Bible says show up on our face? Well, let me just give them to you. Pride, the wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. Why are you angry, God said to Canaan, why is your countenance fallen? The story about Laban and his uh, son-in-law is very clear. His count, the, the, he says to his wife, um, your father's countenance is not the same towards me as it was before. Well, again, you, know, you read the story and you find out that he was bitter. Laban was bitter at his son-in-law for the way that that situation with the cattle turned out. Uh, Lust not after her beauty in your heart, neither let her take you with her eyelids. Sensuality shows up on her face. Rebellion, the Bible speaks of rebellion even in terms of being a stiff-necked people. Guilt shows up on our face when we are, the Bible talks about shamefacedness in the King James Version. <clears throat> Selfishness, it is actually a term which appears at least once in the Old Testament and once in the New Testament. It talks about an evil eye. Now that's talking about somebody who is stingy. But the Bible says all these evil things in Mark chapter 7, and one of them is the evil eye, or, or stinginess, um, it's a biblical colloquialism for stinginess. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. So this is just a sampling of the things that the Bible says, the kinds of sins that the Bible says can show up on our face if we are not careful. On the other side of the coin, we have to remember that one smile can cover a multitude of sins. And so that's why as you're teaching your children to communicate, a smile goes a long way. All right, now let's take a look uh, first at some general forms of disrespectful communication, and then we're going to zoom in and look at it um, in, a great, in greater detail. What are some of the forms of disrespect that you would say are especially infuriating to parents? Before I tell you, you tell me. What, what, kinds of, what kinds of things do you think are disrespectful? Whether they be words, actions, attitudes. Rolling your eyes. Rolling your eyes, yeah. You know, going, going back to that communication pie, we, we can, don't you love it when you say, you say to your kids, don't roll your eyes at me. I'm not rolling my eyes. I'm looking right at you. Don't tell me you're not rolling your eyes. You know, we can hear the words that we're using, and we can, to a certain extent, hear the tone of our voice, but we don't always know what's on our face. I mean, I dare say if I, you know, these things are apparently going to be on video, I'm going to look at the video tubes, the videos, maybe, and I'll say, oh, I wish I'd had that. I didn't realize my face, because I, mean, I, I can't see it, right? 
But we have to keep that in mind. So we have to depend upon other people, especially our family members, especially our husband and wife, our spouses, to help us with that. I mean, sometimes the girls will call me, Dad, are you angry? No, I'm not angry. Why, why, uh, no, I'm not angry. You have this look on your face. Oh, yeah, you know what? I was thinking about this situation. I guess, I guess um, you know, I'm kind of upset about a situation that happened at work or whatever. Yeah, but we don't realize what's on our face half the time. What else? Yeah, well, let's do that. That's the first one I have down here. Interruption, okay? Now, a uh, few things kill the free-flowing exchange of ideas that, like interruption does. Whether it's in the middle of a sentence or a diagram, when you interrupt another person, when your children interrupt you, um, they violate several biblical principles. Why is it so wrong to rudely interrupt people? Yeah. Okay, a fool has no delight in understanding, Proverbs 18, 2, but only in giving his own opinion. Right? And then, um, Proverbs, that's Proverbs 18, 2, and then Proverbs 18, uh, 13 says, he who answers a matter before he hears it, it's folly and shame him. That's what you end up doing half the time, you're answering a matter before you hear it. And then, even the fact that it's, it's rude, I mean, 1 Corinthians 13 says, love has good manners, and <clears throat> it is often, usually, considered rude to interrupt someone and when children interrupt us it also communicates sometimes a know-it-all attitude that essentially says i know where you're going with that and you're wrong and i'm not gonna let you go there so you know somebody needs to write a book on how <clears throat> children provoke their parents to <laughs> anger all right <clears throat> then there's inattentiveness um Again, when you are inattentive to uh, another person, especially when children are inattentive to their parents, uh, it is often uh, a matter of um, not being, uh, it's, it's really answering a matter before you hear it in a sense, and it's also a matter of not understanding, but only in giving your own opinion. And again, it is rude. Sometimes, this inattentiveness takes place in the form of um, you're talking to your child and he's or she's formulating a different response to what you're saying. And that comes across uh, as arrogant. A fool finds no pleasure in understanding, but delights in airing his own opinions is the way the NIV says that. You remember Job's friends? You know, his first three friends, I mean, they ended up really playing the fool. They sat there, and at first they seemed to sympathize with him, and they listened, they didn't say anything, but then they started talking, and they ended up answering a matter before they heard it. They ended up basically falsely accusing him, and it wasn't until, you know, probably days later that Elihu, the fourth counselor, came along, and he said, Job, the problem is that you're justifying yourself rather than God. And as soon as he finishes his rebuke, of Job, then the Lord steps in and pretty much takes over where Elihu left off. But the first three friends of Job really weren't attending to what he said. They heard him, but they really weren't being attentive. Now, um, let's see if I have this on a slide. Oh, no, I don't. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the book of Proverbs uses a variety of terms to describe a child's responsibility to be attentive to his parents. Can you think of any verses in the Bible that tell the children to be attentive to his parents? Let's, hear, let's have them. What do you think? Yes. Right. Proverbs 1 8. Hear my son, your father's instructions, hear, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. All right? What else? How about Proverbs 4, 1 and 2? Hear, O sons, the instruction of a father. Give attention that you may gain understanding. For I give you sound teaching. Do not abandon my instruction. Again, Holy Spirit talking to children. 
says you need to be attentive to what your parents are telling you. You remember, some of you do, some of you probably won't. You remember that commercial years ago, that E.F. Hutton commercial? When E.F. Hutton speaks, what, everybody listens. All right, well, that's what God is saying here. When your parents speak, you need to basically memorize what they have to say. How about Proverbs 4, 20 and 21? My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your sight. Keep them in the midst of your heart. Memorize what they're saying. Proverbs 5, 1. My son, give attention to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding. I mean, do your kids know these verses? How about Proverbs 6, 20 and 22? My son, observe the commandment of your father and do not forsake the teaching of your mother. Bind them continually upon your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you walk about, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk to you. Proverbs 7, 1 through 3. My sons, keep my words and treasure my commands within you. Keep my commandments and live, and my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablets of your heart. I mean, you think God wants the kids to attend to their parents? And then Proverbs 7, 24. Now therefore, my son, my sons, listen to me. Pay attention to the words of my mouth. And so not only is it a sin, generally speaking, for us to be inattentive, because as I said, it's rude, but it's especially sinful for children because the Bible says they need to attend to what their parents are saying. And as I made the point in the last session, you know, <clears throat> it's our job to teach our children, remind our children at least of what the Bible says about their responsibility to, in this case, pay attention to what we're saying. Next, not communicating willingly. One of the most uh, difficult counseling, or I should say communication difficulties I encounter in my counseling office is a passive rather than active communicating partner. <clears throat> and of course, who do you think is typically more culpable of this, the men or the women? Who do you think tends to be more passive in a, in a relationship? Men. Yeah, men. And that's especially troubling because, you know, God made Adam to be the initiator and Eve to be the responder. And, you know, if there's anything that we learn from the Bible about what bib biblical masculinity really is, it's that we're supposed to take the initiative. And it's not that women can't initi initiate and men don't respond, but initiation is what God wants us to do, whether it's <coughs> initiating talking, whether it's initiating solving a problem, whether it's initiating a potential conflict or a confrontation with our wife or our children or whoever, we are supposed to initiate. Whether it's initiating the, the, the process by where a conflict can be resolved, it's really much more the man's responsibility than the woman. I'm not saying women can't and shouldn't take the initiative. It's just that it's the masculine role to take the initiative in these things, not the men. Nevertheless, <clears throat> children, don't take initiative, as they should. And take initiative, by take initiative, I mean they, they don't often communicate willingly. And we have to help them see that this is not God's plan for them. Um, now, what, what about, oh, what about children? Um, as I said before, God has given us as parents the responsibility to bring up our children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, and that means we have to teach them not only how to act and speak like Christians, but how to think and be motivated like Christians. And so what that means is we have a responsibility to ask them questions, to draw out of them. Remember the verse, Proverbs 25, 20 verse 5? Counsel in the heart of man is as deep water as a wise man draws it out. <clears throat> We've got to get our kids to open up those. Remember the revelation process I told you about before? Well, you need to explain that to your kids. Look, if you and I are going to have a relationship, you're going to have to pull the curtain back and open up. Sometimes in counseling, I'll ask a, a, a teenager especially, well, who are your closest friends? Well, it's so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. 
Would you consider your parents one of your closest friends? Uh, you know, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Where would they be on the list? You know, first, second, third, fourth. And if they're not first or second, my typical response is to have, have the parents there, the parent and the child, and I'll have the parent ask the child, okay, I want you to ask Charlie what his friend Josh has that you don't have. I mean, why is it so much easier for you to open up to Josh than it is to me? And I get them to try to talk about this. And a lot of times it's because, you know, the parents are not um, being reasonable or, you know, and that's an interesting thing. You know, the wisdom from above is reasonable. It's easily entreated. A lot of parents don't talk to their kids because they know that they don't talk to their parents. A lot of kids don't talk to their parents because they think their parents are unreasonable. And the wisdom from above is full of mercy, it's compassionate, you know, it's reasonable, it's easily entreated. So anyway, I try to have them talk about what it is that the parents can do to create an environment to get the kids to open up even more. <clears throat> A lot of times in this situation, in situations like this, the kids will say, as I'm counseling everybody, well, my parents don't trust me. And my next response is, well, um, have you ever lied to them? And look at me like, you know, how'd you know? You know, you can lie by falsifying information or you can lie by concealing information. So I didn't necessarily know, but I figured there might be a chance that you did that because of all the ways, all the things we can do to cause people not to trust us, lying, either falsifying information or concealing information, usually destroys trust quicker than anything else. And so we talk about that for a while. Then I explained to him, look, if you want your parents to trust you again, you're going to have to do the opposite of what you did to lose the trust. You're going to have to make sure from this point forward you tell them the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. <coughs> and um, that when they ask you a quest question, you know, you give them more than enough information. I mean, you want to give them so much information where they say, you know what, I believe you're ready. That's enough. It's overkill, oversell. And again, I want, and sometimes I'll take a piece of paper and I'll explain to them, look, you have, you have lost trust. And, um, you know, because of that, you're going to have to try to earn the trust back that you've lost. And I'll put the paper on, the pe on my desk, and I'll say, you know, you can, you can try to just flatten it out that way, but it's not going to do much good. If you really, really want to earn the trust back, if you really want to straighten the paper out, what you have to do is go in the opposite direction. You know, you're going to have to demonstrate to them that you're going to do more than is expected in order to be truthful with them. And it's not just falsifying information, it's concealing information. So again, what you need to do is make sure that you give them all the information. In fact, I have an assignment for you, a homework assignment. I want you to ask your parents to give you, to set aside 20 minutes. You say, I want to talk to you about something, and um, it's going to take 20 minutes. It might take a little more, but if you'll give me 20 minutes, I'll be satisfied. When can we get together? And so they go home and they get it set up and say, no, here's what I want you to do. I want you to have your parents sit on the sofa, and then you take one of the chairs in the living room or in the kitchen, I move it up to the sofa as, as close as you possibly can. And I want you to look your parents in the eyes and say this to them. For the next 20 minutes, you can ask me any question about anything you want, and I will tell you the whole truth. I mean, that will earn back a lot of trust if the kids are willing to do that, and they're willing to, to be honest and truthful with their parents. There's another interesting passage of scripture. Remember the pulling the curtain back idea we talked about before? Well, listen to this verse. I think it's very, very insightful. It's found in 2 Corinthians 6. And I think it's very applicable, obviously, as you'll see, to parenting. Paul says, We have spoken freely to you, O Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We've pulled the curtain back. We are, withholding, we are not withholding our affections from you, but you are withholding yours from us as a fair exchange. Now watch this. I speak as to children, parent talking to children, open wide your hearts also. So again, here you, you see that children are to open their hearts to their parents. It's what God expects. All right, <clears throat> and then there's just some basic things about disrespect. As I said before, nothing provokes parents to anger more than disrespect. What is disrespect? Disrespect is first and foremost an attitude of the heart. It's rooted in the sins of pride and selfishness. 
it, uh, it's a root out of which flows all manner of other sins. Resentment, abusive speech, hatred. Disrespect has to do with not esteeming others more highly than ourselves. It's the belief that we are wiser, smarter, cooler, or otherwise better than others. Beyond this, it's not giving others the honor that they are due, and in some cases, it's showing contempt for them. Because it's rooted in the sin of pride, disrespects, disrespect loathes humbling itself in the presence of others by treating them as if they were in any way superior. Yet ironically, it selfishly longs for others to esteem, to esteem itself highly. And so again, the scriptures say, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. That's why I say it's rooted in pride and selfishness. But with humility of, God, of mind, we're to regard others as more important than ourselves. So why is it that children are disrespectful, teenagers especially? Well, there are lots of reasons, but let's look at, let's look at some of them. Sometimes they're disrespectful to divert their attention, to keep from having to do what their parents ask them to do. It's just sort of a tactic that they use to upset their parents, to manipulate their parents, and basically get out of what they want to do. Sometimes they're disrespectful to get even, to vindictively pay the parents back for not giving them what they want. Sometimes they're disrespectful to protest, to teach their parents that they can't treat me that way. Sometimes kids are disrespectful just sort of to be themselves, to, to help them see, to help their parents see that this is just the way that I am and I'm not going to change the way I talk for anyone. Sometimes they're disrespectful to manipulate their parents, that is to evoke a sinful response from them so that they'll feel guilty and give the child what they want, or give the child what he wants. Sometimes they're disrespectful to um, register a complaint, to express my disapproval for what they've said or done. Sometimes they're disrespectful to test the limits to see how far they can push their parents before they're told to stop. Sometimes uh, they are disrespectful to, to see who's in control, to discover the extent to which they can manage their parents. Um, sometimes they do it to justify their contempt, to establish the fact that I have good reason not to respect them. And um, there can be lots of other reasons why kids manipulate, but these are some of the more common ones. And then, believe it or not, sometimes there's no real ulterior motive. It's just that the way that the kid has learned to communicate. And they're not necessarily trying to be disrespectful. They don't have an ulterior motive. It's just they don't know any better. They've hang, hung around their friends or whoever, and they've learned to communicate this way. And it's just the way they've learned to communicate. Now, why should parents, or children rather, be respectful to their parents. I mean, what's the, what, the, what should their biblical motivation be? And again, this is what you have to teach them. Okay. All right. It is a command of God. It's one of the Ten Commandments. And again, it's repeated in the New Testament. Yep. It reflects our relationship Hmm, good. So, in other words, because, because we have a Heavenly Father and we are to treat Him a certain way, by learning how to treat our earthly fathers that way, uh, it is uh, a, sort of a precursor, a prerequisite to learning how to respect God. That's good. Well, how about some of these? To, uh, because of the promise of a better quality of life, that it may go well with you, right? 
And then along with that, the promise of a lengthier life, you know, that, that uh, you may live long upon the earth. How about this one? To repay your parents for all that they've done. The Bible speaks about requiring one's parents. How about this one? To build more humility into your life and so access more of God's grace. What do I mean by that? Twice in the Bible it says God resists the proud but gives what? Grace to who? The humble. Now in this case, grace does not mean primarily unmerited favor. Here the grace, I believe, is talking about when we humble ourselves, God gives us supernatural ability to, to do what the Bible says and to <clears throat> want to obey the Bible. It's, again, it's the Philippians 4 thing. It's God, the Holy Spirit, who works in you to make you willing and to make you able to do his good pleasure. And so that's the grace that we have access to. If we're humble, if we're proud, God stiff arms us. He resists us. How about this one? To build more love, which is the, uh, and love is the antidote to selfishness, to build more love in your life. To be an example of Christ to others, especially your siblings. To prepare for marriage. Husbands and wives are both commanded to show respect for each other. The wife is to honor her husband, to be respectful when she as she relates to him. In 1 Peter 3, 7, that says that the husband is to honor his wife as if she were a weaker vessel. And so <clears throat> honor is one of those, is the only responsibility specifically given to the husband that's also specifically given to the wife, or the wife is specifically given to the husband. Um, how about to uh, be a more gracious person in general? And how about to obtain more rewards in heaven? And so, again, these are some of the things you want to explain to your children as you're trying to help them understand, on one hand, the, the, the sinful heart attitude they have that generates the disrespect that comes out of their mouth, and as you're trying to help them have the right kind of motivation to, uh, to change from being disrespectful in heart to being respectful in heart. Okay, so what are some of the specific ways that um, children are disrespectful? Well, let's just go through these. First, sometimes kids are disrespectful by refusing to talk to their parents. They just will not open up. Sometimes they're disrespectful, as we said, by rolling their eyes at their parents. Sometimes they raise their voice at them. Sometimes they call them names. They just flat out tell them no. They threaten them. They look at them in an angry sort of way. Uh, they withhold affection. They just vindictively withhold affection from their parents uh, in a, me, as a means of paying them back for whatever it is that the parents did that they are displeased with. Sometimes they scoff or they mock. Sometimes they talk back. Sometimes they use biting sarcasm. They use profanity. Um, sometimes they embarrass their, parent, their parents or try to in public. They slander them to their friends. They put them down, they, use, uh, they ridicule them, they're ungrateful, they're wise in their own eyes. I mean, even as they're arguing with them, they're wise in their own eyes. They're, they're, they demonstrate to the parents that they think they're wise in their own eyes. They willfully disobey them. Sometimes kids curse their parents, which is a capital offense in the Old Testament, by being rude and unmannerly by refusing to be corrected, by interrupting them when they're talking, by, being, um, by not being attentive when they're speaking, by walking away from them, by murmuring and complaining, by making them out to be ridiculous or contemptible, 
by not following their instructions, by comparing them unfavorably to others, having a condescending attitude, contradicting them in front of others. And so in the book, you know, I have a checklist and we just encourage the kids to go through and to check off and maybe to sit down and check off the ways that they habitually are uh, disrespectful to their parents and to sit down and talk to their parents about these ways in which they are disrespectful. Now, with what should the children replace their disrespectful attitudes? What are some things that kids can do to put off, to correct, to use our analogy from before, their disrespectful attitudes and to put on respectful ones? Well, they can be attentive to them. They can be affectionate to them. They can express gratitude to their parents. They can commend their parents to their friends. They can obey their parents' instructions. They can respond with yes sir and no ma'am. They can smile at them. They can ask their parents for their opinions every once in a while, rather than waiting for them to you know, tell them their opinion. They can use terms of endearment. They can follow their parents' instruction. They can use good manners. They can speak, seek to spend time with their parents rather than just running up to their room and you know, hibernating for the night. They can pray for their parents. They can honor them publicly. They can quickly admit when they're wrong. They can offer to help them with their chores, that is the parents' chores. They can telephone them if they're going to be home later than expected. They can speak to them in a warm, pleasant tone. They can carefully choose gracious words when they speak with them. They can hold their tongue when they're too angry to speak graciously. They can buy them or make them an unexpected gift of appreciation. They can cheerfully accept a no answer from them rather than the typical incessant pushback that they give. They can look directly at them when they're speaking. And there are lots of other things, but the point is we encourage the kids in the book, and you can just do this with them. You can read the book either with them, especially if you have, this book is written for teens and preteens. So pretty much <clears throat> anyone from a 12 year old, in some cases if you have a really, really sharp 11 year old, um, all the way through. I've actually even given this book to adults because there's just a lot of really helpful material in here. But whether you buy the book or use the book or not, these are things you need to talk to your children about. Again, it's your responsibility to teach them the difference between respect and disrespect and help them understand the extent to which they've been disrespectful and the extent to which God expects them to change. But here's some ad additional suggestions for shepherding disrespectful children. First, Remind them <clears throat> that they will not always have to obey you, but will always have to honor you. I've said this twice already before, but give them hope and say, look, someday, you know, you're not going to have to obey me anymore, but you better really get used to this honoring thing because you're supposed to honor me for the rest of your life or it's not going to go well with you. Train them to distinguish between your personality and your position. This is really important. <clears throat> you know, your kids may not like your personality, but God has given you a uniform, and they're supposed to salute the uniform, even if they think the uniform is six sizes too big. And we see this in the Bible. In Acts chapter 23, Paul is brought in before the Sanhedrin, and um, somebody, I like to see the Sanhedrin in this balcony, so somebody stands up and says, okay, Paul, you can speak for yourself. He's got a guard on either side of him. And Paul begins, Brothers, you remember he was part of the Sanhedrin at one point in time. Brothers, I live in all good conscience. I have lived in all good conscience <clears throat> before I got up to this day. Somebody stands up in the balcony and says to him, says to one of the guards, um, "Will you please punch him in the mouth?" And so the guard hauls off and slugs Paul. At which point Paul looks at that guy, 
and he, he's got his personality right. He begins to assess his personality. And he rebukes him. He says, God will smite you, you whited wall, which you hypocrite. For you stand here to judge me according to the law, and you command me to be smitten contrary to the law. Somebody else stands up and says, oh, Paul, do you know what you just did? You just reviled the Lord's high priest. And as soon as Paul realized that that personality had a position that he didn't recognize before, he backs up, he takes the hit for it. He basically apologizes and condemns himself out of the law. He says, brothers, I didn't realize that I knew it not. I didn't realize he was the high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of the ruler of your people. So again, he had to, you know, as soon as he recognized that rotten personality had a position, he had to salute the uniform. And that's what you have to get your kids to try to understand. And, and I want to tell you something. You know, I don't understand why exactly. I've thought a lot about it. If I can figure it out, I'll probably write a little book about it. But the X and Y generation don't get respect the way we did. There's something in our culture that it's really, really hard for them to grasp the fact that God expects them to salute the uniform. Basically, in today's culture, if your personality, I don't have to respect you unless your personality is such and such and so and so. And not that that standard is even a biblical standard. But we have to teach our children that God expects them to show respect for the position even if the personality is not as they wish it. Even if the personality is awful, as a matter of fact. You still have to you know, honor all men, as the Bible says. <clears throat> teach them to listen actively and not to interrupt you when you are speaking. Much disrespect can be avoided by simply waiting until you, as a parent, have finished saying what you're saying. And you have to tell, explain that to them. Urge them to tell their parents right up front that they will do whatever they're asked to do. I mean, if you want to disarm your parents, I'll tell my teenagers that I'm counseling, um, from hastily cutting you off due to a bad attitude, let them know right up front, just take the gun out of the hand. Let them right, right up front. They're going to do, okay, Dad, if that's what you're trying to do, I, I intend to do it. Okay, let them know. At the end of the day, I'm going to do exactly what you tell me to do, but can we please talk about this? You know, and the parents may say, well, you do what I say, and then we'll come talk about it. Or they may let you talk about it, but let them know that even at the end of the day, if, if you can't persuade them to change their mind, you're going to do what they want you to do. That, that really disarms parents. Anyone in a position of authority, when, when someone comes into you as a person in position of authority, and they're about to make an appeal, and you know they're about to make an appeal, and you say to them, look, before we get started, at the end of the day, I'm going to do what you want me to do, so, you know, don't worry about that. But can I please give you... It's very, very disarming. And you can teach your, your children to do that. Instruct your teenagers to politely tell you and, or ask you for help when they become angry. Dad... You know, I've purposed that I'm not, I'm going to do whatever you say, no matter how much I disagree. Will you please help me express my concerns without getting angry by listening carefully to what I'm saying? But I'm, uh, or mom, um, I want to have a good at attitude about this right now, but I'm not succeeding because I think you're not understanding my point of view. Would you please pray for me? I mean, what are you going to say when your kid has that kind of an attitude? I mean, are you going to give him pushback? He's sitting there acknowledging I've got a bad attitude. He's asking for help. I mean, how many parents in their right mind are going to react negatively to that? Secure a commitment from them that when they lose their cool, they'll stop and ask for forgiveness immediately. Look, they're going to blow it. It's like Skip said, like we've been saying all weekend long. You know, your kids are sinner, sinners. But, you know, if once they pop off and are disrespectful, if they immediately stop and say, Dad, Mom, sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Please forgive me. Again, how disarming is that? Now again, sometimes they're not willing to do that and you may have to send them away and say, look, I know you want to talk about this and I'm willing to talk to you about this, but you have a very disrespectful attitude. What you said was very disrespectful and we are not going to continue this conversation until you come back and ask my forgiveness for being so disrespectful to me. And as my daughters have said on more than one occasion, okay, well, do you want a quick forgiveness now or you want to wait until my, um, my feelings get in line and I can be more sincere? I say, it's up to you. I'll take the forgiveness either way. And invariably, they'll come back and say, Let me, give me 10 minutes, give me 15 minutes. And they come back and they ask my forgiveness. <clears throat> Teach them how to make a biblical appeal. And I think in the Getting a Grip book, I go through the process of how a teenager can make an appeal. 
You know, it's sometimes possible for a teenager to change his parents' mind even after they have finalized a decision. The appeal process, however, requires the child to have an attitude that's 180 degrees in the other direction from this respect. For it to be effective in the future, and more importantly, for it to be pleasing to God, it will require the teen to accept a no answer with a good attitude. <clears throat> Encourage them to work hard at being patient and forbearing when they are corrected. I mean, the kids have to be patient with you. They have to be forbearing with you. You have to help them understand, look, you know, I'm a sinner. I try very hard to make wise biblical decisions. Sometimes I get it wrong. Sometimes I don't have all the information. But when I make a decision that you think is foolish, if you're impatient with me or you can't forbear with me as I'm trying to think things through, then the chances are you're going to add disrespect to the mix and I'm going to be a lot less likely or a lot less winning some, willing sometimes because of my flesh uh, to respond the way I should. Encourage them to be thankful for the fact that you love them enough to do what you believe is best for them. Help them to learn how to choose friends who are characterized by being respectful. I, 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 you know, a whole nother hour we could spend talking about what the Bible says about the influence of negative people. The older I get, the more I'm convinced that as parents, we really need to understand who and what are influencing our children. And we should do what we can to minimize the bad influence and uh, surround them with the right kinds of influences. Remind them that by honoring their parents, they will be blessed according to scripture, and by dishonoring their parents, they will be cursed. You know, and that's Exodus 21, 15, 17, Leviticus 27. Um, and remind them that they too are sinners. In other words, you know, we're not the only sinners in the house. You are as well. Okay. We've got two minutes before we have to go. Does anybody have any questions? Again, if you have a question, we know we're not necessarily talking about somebody in your family. All right, well, let me pray. Father, <clears throat> again, there's a lot of material to digest in a very short period of time. I, I pray the things we've covered today will be helpful. And as we help our children to, to be respectful, as we train them to let their communication be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that they may know how they want to answer every man especially the men and women in their own home, um, that you give us wisdom and grace. I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to remember that this really, like so much in the Christian life, is a matter of a heart attitude, and we pray that we would have the right attitudes, and we pray that we'd be able to not only help our children externally communicate respect, but have an attitude of respect in their heart, even as Paul did, even as he distinguished between people's position in their personality. In Jesus' name, amen.